Uh, thanks for coming tonight. Uh, my name is Ted Fisher. I'm the director of the Center for Latin American Studies here at Vanderbilt. Uh, and this is part of a series of lectures that we started last year uh, trying to offer evidence-based interventions into public dialogues that are going on in the country right now. The work that we do in the academy, the research that we do, expanding our knowledge about the world, and then spreading that knowledge through teaching and events like these are more important now than ever before. And so we're very fortunate to have with us tonight Jose Miguel Cruz to talk about the five myths about MS-13. President Trump has mentioned MS-13 198 times in public speeches since he took office. In May of this year, he was here in Nashville, and I would like to play you a very short clip of what he said when he was here. Time since he became president. Oops. According to one database. Wait, wait, hang on, hang on. <laughs> this vicious gang has transformed once peaceful, beautiful communities that I know so well, I know them all, into blood-stained killing fields, savagely murdering, raping, and mutilating their victims. The community. So, in that context, it's really important that we know what MS-13 is really about. Jose Miguel Cruz got a, uh, has studied both at Oxford, you got an MA in public policy from Oxford before you came to Vanderbilt. He graduated with a PhD in political science from Vanderbilt, and he's currently the director of research at the Latin American and Caribbean Center at Florida International University. So without further ado, please join me in welcoming Professor Jose Miguel Cruz. Thank you, Ted. Uh, good evening, everybody. Uh, it's really nice to be here, to be back uh, to Vanderbilt, where I haven't been here for eight years, so it's nice to be back. And thank you uh, to all the team of the Center of Latin American Studies uh, for bringing me, bringing me uh, back. So what I'm going to do is, is to talk about MS-13, right? Uh, and we're talking about MS-13 basically because President Trump wants us to talk about MS-13, right? Otherwise, MS-13 wouldn't, uh, wouldn't be this, you know, this, this topic, at least not, in the, not in, the, in the sense that the current administration wants us uh, to believe. So I, I have been working with Central American gangs and MS-13 for more than 20 years now. And some of the things I'm going to present here are based on my research. Uh, my research that I started actually in you know, 1996. So what is MS-13 to start with? Uh, well, it's a youth street gang uh, prevalent in the Northern Triangle of Central America. What we call the Northern Triangle are basically these three small, tiny countries in Central America, Guatemala, El Salvador, and in Honduras, and I stress this idea of being a youth street gang, because that's what basically is. Uh, uh, in some places, especially in the Northern Triangle, have some features of organized crime or, uh, uh, groups, but in, in its core, MS-13 is still a youth street gang, and I'm going to talk a little bit about that. And, and MS-13 is part of a wider phenomenon uh, called the Central American Mara, so Centra, or Central American gangs or pandillas, right? So MS-13 is just one of them, actually. The other important one that we are not talking about is the 18th Street Gang. In the, and the 18th Street Gang has a similar uh, uh, story, history of MS-13, but, uh, but we're not talking about that one, and I'll try to advance some reasons why we are not uh, later in my talk. So here are some pictures of MS-13 uh, gang members from uh, the mid-2000s, all of them tattooed uh, in their faces, uh, ready for war, ready for war against other gangs, especially in Central America. You can recognize them uh, looking at M MS in their, Forefront and this sign, which is the sign of MS-13, 
MS-13. Please pay attention to this because I'm going to explain how this came, came, came about. Uh, where are these Central American Maras who, who, uh, uh, that are part of the MS-13 uh, group? Well, these are uh, basically network of small groups or cliques operating in different communities across uh, Central America and who are unified but as the same identity. So you have different groups that in many cases they don't know each other, right? But they share this identity. They share being MS-13 and they share a, 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 a system, a sort of system of values and norms that defines MS-13 or, or, uh, or the other one, the, the, the 18th Street Gang. They, they mainly operate in Honduras, Guatemala, and El Salvador with more than 100,000 people in their ranks. Uh, I have to say that a lot of copycats or a lot of young people have tried to emulate these gangs uh, and they use the name MS-13 or they will use uh, 18th Street Gang, but most of them basically are just trying to uh, attract some attention from authorities, right, or from, you know, the neighborhood. They just, in some cases, they just want to steal some fear in, in some communities and they will use MS-13, but they really are not MS-13 in the sense that they haven't been recognized by by the gangs in, in Central America. So sometimes when the press, when the media says, oh, there is MS-13 here, MS-13 there, they are basically, or usually they are just copycats or trying to uh, get some, some, some attention. Um, these gangs actually in Central America have transformed into powerful protection rackets, in, so especially, especially in some areas in El Salvador, in Honduras, in Guatemala. And their main uh, criminal uh, activity is the legal protection uh, conducted through or via extortion, right? So they will store the population uh, in the communities where they, where they live, where they roam. Um, uh, and this is very interesting because this morning we have a discussion with, with some, 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 some students here at, 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 at the class why they will not get into another type of criminal activity? Well, in Central America, because there is nothing else that has more value than remittances, right? In Central America, remittances are basically the main, uh, the, the, uh, the main commodity, right? Whereas if you go to Colombia, if you go to other countries in Latin America, Mexico, or in Colombia, you have uh, Coke, you have, uh, a gold, you have oil, in Mexico you have oil, so criminal groups will tap into that. In Central America, you know, Central America doesn't have oil, Central America doesn't, have, doesn't produce cocaine, right, uh, coca, uh, uh, so, so the only thing that they can tap into is the cash coming from remittances, and that's what basically uh, MS-13 targets, you know, the cash from poor communities who receive these uh, remittances from, from the United States. They are extremely violent indeed in these communities and they also participate in local drug trafficking, in uh, sicariato activities or hitman activities and provide security to some drug transshipments. But, uh, 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 but to be sure, they are not the type of criminal organization that you will expect from something like the Sinaloa cartel or the Chapo Guzman organization. These remain mostly youth, uh, youth gang, kind of youth gang uh, organization. Uh, so the big question is whether MS-13 is taking over communities in the United States. Are they really a national threat as they have been uh, portrayed uh, by by the current administration? And my response to that is no. Uh, and for that, uh, I think it's very helpful to examine the five prevalent myths uh, that exist around MS-13. First, the first myth is that MS-13 was created by Salvadoran guerrillas or Central American guerrillas, right? It's pa it's pa as part of that aura of MS-13, it basically is a sort of a spin-off of guerrilla movements 
or these violent uh, arm organizations, right? Uh, and for instance, you, uh, even National Geographic has used this kind of argument, right? The original MS-13 members were former guerrilla fighters who brought their war experience and hard attitude toward life and death, right? Uh, you have, I have seen also this in, 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 in the Atlantic, for instance, using this same argument. But actually, when you look at you know, the origins of MS-13, are quite different. The original members actually were teenagers who bonded around metal music and the need to belong to an identity-based group. And they were formed in Southern California in the 1980s, basically uh, formed by the children of Salvadorian and Central American refugees who were fleeing the civil wars in, in, in Central America. And most of them were too young to belong to guerrillas or armored groups. However, what they did within the, the, the you know, the, within the, the landscape of gangs in, in, in LA, well, they will use this, this aura of coming from El Salvador or coming from, from Guatemala that weren't at war, and they will use that to say, ah, oh, we're coming from these war-torn countries, so we know how bad, can, how bad things can be, right? And, and some people interpret that as a way to, oh, these, are, these might be guerrillas, but they certainly were too young to be part of any armed movement then. Today, even today, even today, some people will say, no, they were guerrillas in the, in the, in the civil wars. But most of MS-13, most of the gang members are between 15, uh, between 15 and 25 years old. So they were basically born way, way after uh, the end of the civil wars in, in Central America. Some of them, they, they, they have no idea what were the civil wars in, 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 in Central America. This is a picture of one of the original cliques of, of, of MS-13 in, in LA around 2000, uh, I'm sorry, around 1982. Uh, you can see them basically are young people you know, who are flashing their sign. And, the si and they're flashing this sign, the, the MS-13 sign, because they were, as, as, as I mentioned earlier, they were originally stoners. They went to con rock concerts, and when rock concerts were doing this, right? And from there, they took that, those signs to become, because that seemed like an M, Right, and they took that and they turned it into this, right? That, which is the, the sign of MS-13. But that sign came from, you know, the basically thing that m many stoners, when they go to rock concerts, when they are high, they start doing this, right? That's the origin of that sign, right? Uh, so, uh, so that's uh, about the first myth. Let me go to the second myth. Now, MS-13 is well organized and controlled from El Salvador, right? And one of the arguments, well, one of the things in 2012, the Treasury Department actually designated MS-13 as a significant transnational criminal organization, especially two or three persons who were leaders of MS-13 that they were designated as, you know, as a threat to the U.S. Uh, the, New, uh, the New York Post, for instance, said that MS-13 has better organizational structure than some corporations, right? And to put it like, to put it like you know, this is better than, I don't know, what would be a, a, a transnational corporation, McDonald's, uh, uh, Coca-Cola company. Uh, to put MS-13 at that level uh, is an exaggeration. They indeed, the reality is that they indeed, in, especially in, in El Salvador, they have, uh, they are, they have a you know, well-developed organization, right? And they function based on the decisions taken mostly by this group of people. These are the leaders, the national leaders of MS-13 in El Salvador, basically operating from prison. This is, a, this is a, a picture from prison, of MS-13 in, in prison. Why? Because it's in prison, ba the prison is basically their headquarters, right? And this is where basically they have all the time to organize and to structure the gang in El Salvador. So these are the national 
leader. So in the case of MS-13, MS-13 doesn't function with a single leader, but all the decisions are taken you know, in a collegiate way. So with, uh, they work as a board, right? And the, if you can say that way, this is the board of MS-13, or at least this was the board of uh, uh, MS-13 around 2012, right? But this operates for El Salvador. Once you are out El Salvador, they no longer command anything, right? Because Guatemala has its own leadership, Honduras has its own leadership, and the United States doesn't have actual, actually, they don't have any leadership. Because in, in, in the United States, basically, I'm formed still by a group of fragmented and, 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 and separate cliques. So the gang is loosely organized in the United States. We don't have any information that indicates that they are structured in the way they are in El Salvador, right? There's no national leadership at all in the United States. Why? Because it's very difficult to coordinate because the government in the United States won't put all the gang leaders in a single prison and will lead them, you know, free, free time, right? So you, if, you, if you need a national leadership, if you want a, a national leadership, you need to put them together, right, and give them time to organize, which basically is what happened in El Salvador, what happened in Guatemala, and what happened in Honduras. That is impossible in the United States, right? Because anyone who wants to be a leader in the United States basically is immediately put into isolation in some prison somewhere in the middle of the desert, right, without any chance of communicating with the rest. Right. Uh, so the gang actually, what happened in the United States, the gang varies depending on the location. So we have MS-13 in LA that operates in a very different way from MS-13 in the East Coast, right? In the East Coast, in Washington DC, in Boston, in New York, you see them over there much more violent in those places than in LA. Why? Why? Because in LA, basically, MS-13 has to work very close to other, with other gang members, with other gang organizations, such as the Mexican Mafia, for instance, or the 18th Street Gang. So it's very difficult to organize anything in the East Coast too, but in the East Coast are way, way uh, less developed than in the, in, the, in the West Coast. Some leaders actually from El Salvador have attempted to get control, some kind of control in the US, but have been repeatedly rejected not only by the authorities here, but also by the gangs here, because they don't want to have anyone coming from El Salvador or from Central America telling them what to do. So the dynamics of the gang are basically determined by local conditions uh, and local conditions, local conditions only. Now, myth number three, and this is one of the, one of, one of the myths that have uh, get a lot of attention lately. Illegal immigrants are coming to the U.S. to expand MS-13, right? So President Trump has equated illegal immigrants, and we all have heard this, with MS-13 members who want to pour into, uh, into and infest our country, right? What is, uh, what is the reality? Well, according to CBP, Customs and Border Patrol, even these are data from the administration, in 2017, 228 people uh, out of uh, almost uh, more than 300,000 immigrants apprehended had some links to MS-13. This means that of the all, pe of all people who were apprehended by CBP in the border in 2017, less than 1% had any connection with MS-13. So this idea that you know illegal immigrants or MS-13, especially those coming from Central America, and they are taking over, is not uh, it basically is not substantiated by the by the by the data uh, by the truth. In 2016, 17, uh, I conducted a study with gang members, uh, with more than 1,200 gang members. We interviewed, we did a survey, we did a poll. Uh, I learned about a lot about poll here in Lapop. So I use some of that knowledge to interview gang members, right? Because that's sort of the things that I, that, that I do. And I interview gang members in El Salvador, and one of the questions, were, one of the questions was uh, whether they have ever been in the United States. Because one, as part of this idea 
of part of this argument that they're putting to our borders here in the United States is that they're coming and going and they're coordinating and coming like a revolving door, right? They come here, they get deported or they go back, they coordinate there and they come back with instructions and all those things. Well, of all the people we interview over there, basically uh, only 9% of them have been in the United States. 91% of them have never been in the United States. Uh, and very likely they will not ever be in the United States. Also, the study also revealed that close to 7% of them have some connections with the U.S. And even when you think about that, it's very low. Because if you think about the level of immigration, of Salvadorian migration here to the United States, and the huge community of Salvadorian migrants in the United States, you know, the, the fact that only 7% of the gang, of the gang members, have any connection with people here actually is very low. When almost 30% of Salvadorians live in the, in, in the United States. The growth of MS-13 is more linked to the relocation of family members. So when you see some MS-13 gang members moving, they are moving not because they want to move to other city, to take over the city, or to start a new program of the, of, of the gang. Actually, they, they call some, some, uh, some part of the organization they call programs. So, so when they move to other city, they don't move because they want to start another program of the, of the gang, but because their family is moving and they have to move with them. Because after all, and remember, this is a youth street gang. So most of the members are kids who have to move with their family. When their family tells them they have to go, they have to go, right? So they move with the family. Right? And sometimes when you see, oh, there's MS-13 in this, in this city, this new, you know, this new uh, cells of MS-13 here, it's maybe just a family that just moved there and happened to have a boy or a girl who was member of MS-13, MS and in some cases, they move also expecting to leave, to, to basically take some distance from the gang, um, to, f uh, to flee to some extent from, from, from the gang. Um, uh, myth number four, to combat MS-13, we have to stop immigration from Central America, right? This has been a central message uh, regarding MS-13. In 2018, uh, President Trump said, I'm calling on Congress to finally close the deadly loopholes that have allowed MS-13 and other criminals to break into our country. All right. That's what, what he said, or the administration said. The reality is that most MS-13 gang members who are in the United States join here, join the gang here. Right? Some of them are certainly uh, immigrants, but some others, and actually according to the, to the figures we have, most of them are basically second generation Central Americans, right? People who were born here and who grew up here and joined the gang here. Uh, so local conditions, so local social conditions and personal life events are more important determining who joins the gang than immigration. So it depends where they live. Right, what is the condition of the community to join the gang rather than just immigration? Recruits from, a, from broken and dysfunctional families with parents that spend little time with their kids. So one of the things that cross you know, all gangs here and in Central America is that many of these kids, the only, the only, the only space they have um, to make friends, you know, to be part of something, is the street. Why? Because their parents don't pay attention to them with, because of neglect or because they basically are too busy trying to survive with two or three jobs that they don't pay attention to their kids, right? So the kids go to the street, make friends in the street, and to whoever is in the street to try to get through that special period of life that is adolescence, right? Literature shows that community services, quality of school system, and local law enforcement policies play a more important role in determining the success of the gang. So if you have a community with very low uh, social capital in which you know, uh, uh, law enforcement really doesn't pay attention to what's happening in the community, well, you have 
MS-13 of other guns basically growing up there. Uh, and it's very telling, for instance, uh, there is a, a, a recent uh, report from ProPublica, I think, was published last week, uh, show how, for instance, for these uh, uh, killings that occur in, in Long Island uh, some months ago, how, for instance, uh, uh, law enforcement in Long Island didn't pay any attention to the families of the victims because they thought oh, these were just problems, you know, these immigrants, so we won't pay attention to that, right? So, you know, th this kind of uh, neglect of law enforcement sometimes basically opens the space to guns to, uh, uh, to flourish and to establish there. And obviously not all Central American immigrant communities present a problem with MS-13. So, so if you think about that, not all Central American communities are full of MS-13 gang members. I live in Miami, and there is an important Central American community in Miami, but you don't hear about MS-13 in Miami. Why? Because the local resources of the community, law enforcement, are very different in the way they treat Central American, Central American immigrants than, let's say, other, other, other cities. And that makes a difference. That makes a difference in the likelihood of MS-13 happening there. Re research shows that the best way to prevent the establishment of street gangs is to work with local communities to address the issues that push youth to seek gang membership. Uh, and sometimes this, the indiscriminate fight against undocumented immigration alienates Hispanic communities from law enforcement and prevent and will prevent collaboration to stop the gang in, in, in the U.S. So, and this is a very important point because in this climate of, of targeting uh, immigrant communities, what is going to happen more, uh, most likely is that these Hispanic communities won't trust law enforcement. And you need communities to work with law enforcement in order to prevent guns or MS-13 to establish there. But if you are isolating these communities from the institutions, from law enforcement, guess who's going to provide security? or safety to the people in the community, well, other criminal organizations, right? <clears throat> Let me jump on this. Uh, finally, myth number five is MS-13 is a threat all o uh, in communities all over, to communities all over uh, America, right? all over the United States. President Trump said that MS-13 has literally taken over U.S. cities. Mm -hmm. uh, Ted just played, you know, part of, uh, of, of, of that soundbite. Uh, the White House said that gang has brought violence, fear, and suffering to communities nationwide. Now, what is MS-13? What is really the weight of MS-13 in America? Is it really, you know, one of the most important gangs in, in America? Well, according to the FBI, it's not, right? Uh, MS-13 actually is a small gang compared to other gangs in, in the United States. Actually, the 18th Street Gang, you know, the opposing gang is actually larger, so with almost approximately 50,000 people in the U.S., right? And you, I'm sure you have heard about the Crips, right? There are more Crips than MS-13 in the U.S. And there are more gangster disciples, in, disciples, I'm sorry, in Chicago, for instance, than, than, uh, than MS-13 or Latin Kings or the Bloods. Right? So MS-13 actually is a small gang compared to other gangs. Now, it is true that in some places, MS-13 is very violent, it's very brutal, right? Trying to emulate what they see from Central America, which is very violent. In Central America, MS-13 is certainly very violent, as well as the 18th Street Gang. But when you put it in context, MS-13 is just one of those gangs in America, right? And they do not represent a threat to all over the country, but just certain, certain communities, right? And it's basically concentrated in a few Hispanic communities, in Long Island, LA, Washington, DC, and in some cases in, in Boston. Uh, they can be very brutal, as I said, but their activities are limited to barrios, to the barrios they roam. Mm -hmm. It's very much limited to those barrios. And one of the approaches that we have to take is to, you know, uh, to go to these uh, to these barrios, to this, those neighborhoods, and deal with the problems there. But it, but that requires 
that's a very different approach from declaring MS-13 a national threat. When you, what you do with a national threat? Well, you use the National Guard, you use the Army mm, to prevent that. To prevent MS-13, you have to basically deal with the problems that are happening in many of the communities in our cities uh, in the U.S. MS-13 primary targets are other teenagers who live in the area, right? And, uh, and as I said before, MS-13 is a street gang, not a transnational criminal organization. They certainly share the name and they have some contacts, but they do not operate as a transnational criminal organization because they don't have the capability to move uh, goods, drugs, uh, and, and people in the way that the administration wants us, uh, wants us to believe. So any strategy to fight the guy in the U.S. has to consider first addressing the factors that alienate youth in underserved communities in the United States. And that's key, right? That's key. To the extent that we can do that, we will prevent the growth of MS-13. But in my opinion, I don't think we're doing that with this uh, campaign of fear uh, at the national level. We also have to pay attention to the particular needs of immigrant communities. And after all, immigrant communities need a lot of attention, right? And, and, and the kids in these immigrant communities need special attention too, because they, are, they have moved to a new country, they don't speak the language, and that's how MST got formed in the early 1980s, right? Uh, but those communities who deal with guns effectively are usually those communities in which immigrants uh, are recognized and, and basically uh, they're, they uh, are recognized and, 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 and they are part of the, they become part of the community. We have also to take into account the provision of opportunities for the system and rehabilitation to former gang members. Look, I insist on that. These are kids. So if you are a gang member, well, you are, you are 15, 18. By the time you are 21, you are regretting having been part of the gang, right? And this happens across the board. Every, almost every gang member have talked, once they are 21, 22, they say, look, I didn't, know what, I didn't know what I was doing, right? And now it's late, right? Because now I have done this, I have done that, and that, but I just need an opportunity. Certainly, some of them will take those opportunities and, and some others not. But we need to create the conditions for those opportunities to happen for those who really want to get out of the gang. Otherwise, what we're going to have is, is people with 25 years old, 30 years old, with a you know, criminal background who are incapable to go back to society mm, and to reconstruct their life. Right. And this, that's part of the tragedy in Central America. You have thousands and thousands of people in that condition, and the, and the country is unable completely to readapt them. So we have to prevent that also here in the United States. We also have to educate community and business leaders with the potential to generate change. One of the things that we have learned through our research is that you only need to educate the gang, former gang members, right? That's important indeed. But you also need to educate the community. You also need to educate the community leaders, business leaders, religious leaders, so they are able and capable mm, to create the condition for these gang members or former gang members to go back into society. Otherwise, you have you know, very nice programs uh, educating or, or training former gang members, right, who, are, you know, who have left the, their life in the gang, right, and they go back to society, but they found they run into communities and leaders who don't want to do anything with them. And that basically, the other option, the, the only option they have after that is going back to the gang. So we have to prevent that too. We have to enhance community collaboration and, 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 and promote trust in law enforcement. We need to work with law enforcement, right? Uh, and we need the community to work with law enforcement. But under this uh, climate, it's very difficult for some communities to work with law enforcement if they believe that every time they go with law enforcement, ICE is going to come and going to raid the communities and get some people deported, right? Uh, so and that's something that to take, 
to, uh, to take very, very, uh, very much in, in, into account. And finally, refrain from using immigrants as scapegoat, scapegoats for crime and social ills in our country, right? Uh, uh, I, I, and I think this, that's key uh, because to the extent that we can prevent um, exclusion and marginalization, uh, to the extent that we can do that, we will be able to deal with problems such as MS-13. And this is what I wanted to tell you today. Thank you very much. Uh, we have time for some questions, uh, so if you don't mind answering questions, I'll yeah, just... Mm -hmm. I would sit around and say, well, there's a gang I can rent. I mean, it's organized. They got guns. They know how to murder people. It's only you're begging a question. Why aren't the gang, the single gang with a single na name, operating in three countries in Central America, Guatemala, in Honduras, and El Salvador and Honduras? Why hasn't it taken off as a centrally organized corporation the way the New York paper? listed why it hasn't become a powerful element because there it is all organized for me it's like having a political party with no candidate for office um and, and i don't i don't i don't hope it i don't wish it on it but it, it, it makes you wonder why it hasn't turned into something better better organized and more powerful than it really is so some of them have tried, actually, and, and to some extent, especially in El Salvador, some leaders have uh, basically moved to be closer to these kind of criminal organizations, actually. And they, to some extent, they have left the gang as, as it is and become more like, you know, associated with, you know, one of these criminal organizations. But in essence, why the gang, you know, as a whole, as a structure, hasn't gone all the way to be, you know, the, uh, uh, the army of, of Chapo Guzman or any of the big uh, drug lords. Basically, because these are kids. And one of the things that amazes me every time I, I talk with them is that when you talk to them and you ask them, why did you join the gang, right? Why did you join the gang? You know that you're going to be killed. Uh, you know that you may end up in prison. Why? And, and some of the response are because I just want to hang out with somebody, right? And the only, the only group, the only organization that is out there in those communities is the gang, right? And these are 13, 14, 15 year olds, right? Who doesn't have, a, you know, who doesn't have a mind to be part of something like a corporation, right? Like the New York Post said, oh, these are better organized that are American transnational corporation. No, they, they are not thinking that way. They are just thinking and get with somebody, right? Like them, with their peers, right? And they have some kind of recognition, some kind of respect. Once that happens, I mean, when that happens, and then they go into, you know, they mature and they develop and the brain develops, right? When they are 20, 21, they start saying, you know what? Uh, this is not what I expected, and I'm, I'm, I'm uh, and I'm surprised that I'm alive. Some of them will tell me that I'm surprised I'm still alive because I expected to, you know, be be, be dead by now. You know, uh, and now I have to look for something else to do, right? Because I don't want that life for me or for my kids, right? And family plays an important role when they start having kids. Things change for them. Right, so, so certainly some of them will, will move, will transit into criminal organizations, going to the big leagues, some of them, but most of them, most of them joined the gang because they wanted to have a good time. So these are, these are results from my survey 2016, right? Uh, like to hang out with gangs, that, that's why they joined. And look how similar is that 2016 with my original survey in 1996, also like to hang out. So 
despite all the things that have changed in, in the societies, and the reasons are the same. They are kids who want to be part of something, right? As I said before, I mean, some of them are very brutal, very violent, they do terrible things, right? But they do those terrible things but because that's the only thing that they, and basically, they know that they're going to get some kind of respect. You know, and that talks very badly about the, 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 you know, the, the, the state of our societies, especially in Central America. But that's what's happening. Um, hi. I was wondering if you could t tell us um, a little bit about the um, s situation in Guatemala in particular. For which areas in Guatemala they recruit, or from which areas the, the youth come that join MS-13? Um, I was str I spent um, a couple, uh, almost two months in Guatemala each year in the summer, and in in, in a town in in a um, in the Western Highlands, in an indigenous community, and um, the people there, of course list or hear what is said about Central American immigrants here in the States and they they come back with a comment, well, um, they, they all these people send money back. Um, they're just these people, I, I, that's, they didn't spe uh, mention specifically gang members, but the reason they sort of do good stuff, that that's, or the, the fact that um, good stuff comes back from people in the United States, from their communities, or their areas at least, means that they can't be just all bad people. Um, and so um, in the area where I spend my time, I, I don't n know of anybody who is knowingly member, a member of, of MS-13, but I, it, it sort of, yeah, it made me wonder where, where the youth are coming from. Those who are in MS-13 in Guatemala are, uh, um, are concentrated in the capital city, in, in Guatemala City, especially, if I'm not mistaken, around, you know, Zona 18, uh, Zone 18 in the city, which is a, you know, very poor part of, of the city. Uh, there are also some gangs in some cities in the eastern side of, 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 of the country. But gangs, and this is an important point, haven't established in the way they have in the rest of Guatemala, or in the eastern part of Guatemala, or in El Salvador and Honduras, in the in the in the highlands or in indigenous uh, 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 population, and that's one of the big questions of research, right? Why they haven't established there? Why they haven't get a, a foothold over there? There are some hypotheses that point to you know the strong social bonds and community bonds among indigenous uh, communities, right? Indigenous population, right? Uh, and that's certainly one. That might be one one reason. Yeah, if I if I may add, um, in in Awala, in the town where I spent, there well, there was some gang activity maybe a decade ago, and there was a a rape that happened by two suspected gang members. Uh, they were killed immediately. Um, that's why there is no gang in Awala. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, yes, I mean there's ki those kind of uh, those kind of those kind of stories in Guatemala. They are very frequent. Even in El Salvador, there are some. There are some municipalities in the north part of El Salvador there are no gangs at all, right? And, and these communities are very tight. And they have, you also hear these kind of stories. Does that mean that, you know, they have to be, I'm not saying that, but <laughs> at all, right? And there's something that needs to be researched a little bit more in, in, those, in those communities. But that, that's some part of, you know, some people think that's part of the explanation, right? That in some communities, you know, the, 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 uh, the, the social control that some communities exert over you know, their people, especially in the indigenous uh, communities, play a role in preventing gangs from establishing there. Hi. Um, so I work on a number of yeah, asylum cases. And many times, and this is continuing what we were just talking about, putting the focus in Central America and particularly Guatemala, um, I hear is one of the reasons that people are leaving Central America is because of the gangs and because of the violence. Um, 
And so our administration here in the United States is really focused on, as you're showing us, people coming to expand the gangs here, whereas I hear more uh, that people are immigrating to escape the gangs there, um, to escape the violence. And so how in your, do you have research and how much has, have you seen that that's true? And I was looking when you had the reasons that people join gangs. Um, it's a fair, it's like 4% of the people that were forced to join gangs. Uh, but that's often one of the reasons that people give is that I, I'm, you know, being forced to join a gang. And so me and my family are being forced to leave. We need to come to the United States to escape that violence. So can you speak to that? Yeah. In I mean, there's all there's these uh, these cases of uh, immigration because of because of gangs, right? But also in rec in recent years, especially in Honduras, in some communities in Honduras, in El Salvador, there's also this phenomenon of internal displacement. There are a lot of communities that have been displaced internally that people don't uh, emigrate mm, out of the country, but they move to other parts of the country because of gangs. Uh, about the research about migration, uh, I would like to point out to a recent article that John Hiskey with some of his, um, his colleagues, uh, who is young, uh, uh, yeah, uh, he just published in, 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 in LAR, in the Latin American Research Review, uh, using lap, lap, lap data uh, and showing evidence of many of these people who said that they want to leave the country they want to leave the country in Central America not because of economic reasons, but because of fear of crime, or because they have been threatened by 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 gang. So there is some, there are already some some research on on, on that on, in that in that sense. But also, this is something that we are increasingly increasingly seeing, um, and and the, the the lab of folks can tell you about that. I mean, I, I do my surveys on my own too. And increasingly, in the last five, ten years, we have seen how it's very even difficult to get interviewers on the ground uh, without being threatened by gangs, right? Because the moment you step into some communities, you have to deal with the gang. The, you know, you have a, a little boy who's what is called the poste or who's kind of the informant who will immediately notify the gang leaders that is some new people in the community and in around 15, 20 minutes, you will have the gang basically dealing with the interviewers or with the team of interviews there, what are you doing here, right? So it's very difficult even doing that. In some cases, they will be basically pushed out of the community. We don't want you to do surveys here. That's something that we have to deal with too. So yeah, so there is some of that certainly. I was wondering if you could tell us a little bit about what is the relationship between like MS-13 members and the communities that they serve with. I mean, if you have any insights of what are people, what are the perceptions of people that they relate with them? Do they have like positive or negative? Because I mean, there's an everyday social interaction in there. There is, uh, and thank you for that question. Actually. Uh, it depends, it depends on the clique that controls the community. So as I said before, the gang is not as, uh, even though they have, you know, the, these national boards uh, and the national leadership, right, that decides for, all, uh, for the gang as a whole, actually the way the gang operates at the local level is very different from town to town and sometimes from barrio to barrio. It depends on the clique, right? So some cliques are very, uh, uh, are very predatory with the community, so some cliques will basically extort a lot. They will do, you know, a lot of things in their own community, right? And they have very, very complicated relationship with the community, right? Uh, in some other cases, the clique is very nice with the community, and actually the community will protect them, right, uh, from law enforcement. Uh, the community, why? Because the gang, in some cases, the clique will create jobs for the, for, the, for the community. They will provide, you know, resources. They will pay for, you know, you know there is somebody, there is a mother who has a baby with problems. They will pay her to go to the hospital, things like that. But it depends on the clique, 
right? And, all, and there are other cliques that are very much into the drug tra and the local drug trafficking. And everything that matters to them is that the community will work with them in order to enhance the, the, the business model, right? Uh, so you have those diff very different cases. That's why it's very hard to say, well, MS-13 or the gang is, you know, is all this. Well, it's, yes, it's all that, but it depends on certain communities, right? Even within, within the city, right? Independent of some cliques. So there are some cliques that are famous because they are, or they're rather infamous because they're very violent and they're very predatory, right? And some others that just the opposite, right? And it's very hard sometimes for law enforcement to get the collaboration of the community because the gang basically work as a, the gang works as a sort of you know protector, right, of the community. Why are you able to say so specifically? that MS-13 is not in the United States. Well, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not saying it's not in the United States in the way that is in Central America, right? There is, uh, what, I, what, I, what I mean is that MS-13, there, there is MS-13 in the United States in some cities, but the way they operate in the United States and their organizational structure in the United States is very different from Central America. Basically, what we hear about MS-13 being this powerful gang and this very, you know, violent, uh, you know, in many communities, that's mostly true in Central America. But in the United States, it's very different. It's like the, the gang is, is comparatively very weak, right? Uh, their presence is limited to some communities, not in you know the whole United States. So it's very it's very different the way MS-13 operates in the United States. So you say it's different, but I might say, so what? There is still violent here, and they may not do some of the good deeds that you've pointed out they take care of in, um, in those three countries, but they are considered violent here and if it's just that the name is they use MS-13 but they don't operate exactly like MS-13 does that make them less dangerous? No. Certainly, I mean, as I said before, uh, MS-13 MS is very, can be very violent here, right? But my point is, it's not the national threat, it's not the level of, uh, of national threat that it is in Central America. Honest. So it is violent, it is very brutal in some communities here, right? But we have to be able to distinguish that because in order to deal with MS-13 in the United States, we have to deal with the local conditions, with the conditions of the community where they operate. Otherwise, we basically were not doing anything good uh, just by saying, well, this MS-13 is a national threat and we just have to, you know, wherever you see MS-13, we just have to put this kid into prison and or to, you know, you know, or, or apply any draconian measure. I mean, we have to look at every case, and in that sense, we need to take a closer look to how MS-13 operates in the United States. Hey, thanks for the talk. I have a question that you raised at the beginning, which is, why is the 
MS-13 gang more in the national news than the 18th Street gang. So could you tell us a little bit more about that? Yes. That's a, I'm sorry, I forgot about that. But the, the point is that MS-13 and 18th Street gang come basically from the same environment, right? Southern California, uh, and actually uh, uh, the 18th Street gang was formed before MS-13. Uh, the 18th Street gang was formed in the late 1960s, uh, early 1970s, by Chicanos and Mexican immigrants in, in LA. Originally, MS, the, the first members of MS-13 were part of, a, of the 18th Street gang. And at some point, they split. Uh, they formed their own, their own gang because they want to be recognized as Salvatruchos or Central Americans, right? Different from the, from the 18th Street gang. Why we're talking about MS-13 rather than the 18th Street gang? My opinion, and this is my opinion, is because MS-13, for political purposes, MS-13 has an appealing name in the sense that when you talk about MS-13, you're talking about Mara Salvatrucha. You immediately refer to a group of immigrants coming from El Salvador, mm, from another country, and people can relate immediately to that. MS-13, you know, from these foreigners, you know, maybe illegal foreigners who are in this country, right? When you use 18 street gun, there's not, nothing resonates like that. 18 street gun is a street, right? It's just a street in LA, right? It tells you anything tells you nothing about uh, of the condition of immigrants from them. So I think we're talking about MS-13, in addition, uh, because it's, it's violent indeed, but 18th Street is also violent, because, of, because the name appeals to this idea that immigrants can be dangerous. Hmm? Hi there. Um, the graph you showed on 50% um, oh, of them or so wanted to be just in a group or, or hang out. And you see similar statistics with, um, uh, we'll call them terrorism groups in the Middle East uh, and recruitment of young people. Um, institutionally in, in El Salvador or let's say in the Middle East where, where we have some of that kind of activity, what do you think the local governments can do um, you know, we see this in parts of Europe or the United States, whether it's a football club or or what have you, anything, a community center. What do you think they can do better? Um, going along with that in, in the Middle East as well, it seems to be a common thing with 15 to 20 year olds with looking for uh, to be part of a group. Well, I think it's important. I mean, there are a lot of you know initiatives that uh, appeal to these age group, right, providing opportunities and providing alternative spaces, right, like, you know, soccer clubs, uh, other groups. The problem in Central America for many years now is that those alternatives are very limited. So you have some, certainly soccer clubs, you have some what they call um, Casa de Desarrollo, development houses, uh, where, where youth, youth can go to those places and be in a safe environment doing whatever they want to do, right? I mean, playing with computers, playing games, uh, you know, doing different things, learning things. But those are very limited, especially because the governments for many years haven't really invested in anything like that, right? If you go to this place, if you go, for instance, if you go to Honduras, San Pedro Sula, which is, uh, with, uh, which, um, at some point in uh, two, three years ago, was considered one of the most violent uh, cities in the world. If you go to San Pedro Sula, uh, in, in basically you will see is these uh, miles and miles of these uh, small houses, you know, very slum-like houses where people live without any any uh, recreational spaces. Uh, if you are a kid there. Basically, the only space that you have to do something different than your home, which is your home will be just, a, you know, uh, I don't know, a very limited space, is to go to the street, right? So governments haven't really uh, paid attention to the need of development, uh, developing space for youth 
especially for marginalized youth or poor people in these places. So you really need to invest on those things. The irony is that if you, if you look at what the U.S. has been doing, the U.S. has been pouring money a lot on Central America for many years now. Uh, in, in the last administration, the Obama administration did a lot put on, with the, the CARSI program. The irony is that a lot of that money that should be uh, you know, directed to those, uh, uh, to those kind of initiatives ends up in the pockets of politicians, right? That's why you have right now in Central America many former presidents and former you know, politicians basically going to jail. You know, because they have basically bankrupted the, the, the government, the state. They have kept a lot of the money. Uh, so there, there needs to be some politi political will from the local elites you know, to address those problems you know, of their own people to deal with this. Super. Thank you. Thank you.